Well, good morning. After all that music, I was waiting for uh, Francis to pop out at any moment. But <laughs> So good morning, and thanks to all of you for joining us. I'm Hunt Willard, and together with Ambrose Wonkum, we'll moderate this year's Distinguished Speakers Symposium on the future of human genetics and genomics. In celebration of all that our field has accomplished in the past 75 years since the founding of ASHG in 1948. A few announcements before we begin. At the outset, I should state that as a moderator, I have no financial disclosures to make. Have none. Ambrose also uh, has no financial disclosures to make. Uh, ASHG's policies prohibit video and audio recording or taking pictures of speakers or their slides. However, it does allow for posting comments on social media. Open captioning will be available on the presentation screen behind me. And for the Q&A period, which will take place after all of the speakers are done, you may come to the microphones that are in the aisles with the number one and number two, uh, or you can submit questions via the online plan, uh, planner or mobile app. Please direct your questions to a specific speaker if that's relevant. And lastly, this session is, in, uh, is eligible for continuing educational credits. So now let us begin. We'll hear today from four speakers, this after, what will become this afternoon, sharing their views of human genetics and genomics and its future from a variety of perspectives, public discourse and education, chromosome variation and disease, disparities in health care and health outcomes, and what it means to have a worldwide pan-genome and complete genomes for individuals. A perhaps sobering thought to begin. I'm struck that many of the big questions that our founders pursued over the past 75 years, especially in the early decades of ASHG, actually remain very similar to the ones we ask today. We just, we ask that many past presidents of our society who have shared their wisdom in their presidential addresses. So read Muller's paper on our load of mutations delivered at the 1949 ASHG meeting, and no, I was not there. Identifying and understanding mutations is still with us, although to be sure, the methods have changed and the wealth of data available to us now is both deep and rich. The search goes on, now much enriched by deepening our understanding that health and disease around the globe is the joint product of both gene variation and social determinants. Or read John Hammerton's or Janet Rowley's addresses about chromosome rearrangements and variants and their clinical impact. One doesn't have to look far to recall how much the art of cytogenetics contributed to the early stages of what was to become the Human Genome Project, or how the identification of specific genes or even non-coding sequences has helped the field move from chromosomal anomalies themselves to how individual genes altered by those rearrangements explain the causes of specific diseases associated with chromosome variation. More to come on that. Once Mendel's principles were rediscovered early in the last century, it did not take long before they were found to be applicable to human genetics and human disease. And yet genomics and the recent study of populations and disease have taught us that these principles are now much more nuanced than once thought and modify how we view the role of genetics in shaping our history worldwide. This is both old news and new news. To quote Lawrence Snyder, our prescient president in 1950, only by teamwork involving scientists from many areas that can, can there be an understanding of human genetics be expected to advance. And so here we are, some 70 plus years later after his comments, newly exploring complete genomes around the globe with teams and consortia of scientists that include experts from numerous fields and numerous backgrounds promising to deliver yet new insights about our shared past. And most recently, think of Charles Rotimi's address last year, One Human Race, Billions of Genomes. In the long history of ASHG, how many could have predicted that now that we, have com we can have complete, truly complete genomes for individuals, not just a single reference genome that we all call ours, or that we would see the first human pan genome that captures the full range of variation across entire genomes and across the globe billions of genomes indeed. As Victor McCusick presaged in his 1974 address, 
it has taken a long journey of careful cataloging of clinical disease, collections, and maps, lots of maps. This journey would lead ultimately to many gene discoveries, the Human Genome Project itself, newfound variants, and increasing amounts of clinical testing, with complete sequencing for all finally within our sites. I started by saying that the big questions our founders pursued in the early decades remain the same questions that we're working on today. And while I found this to be largely true, especially at a high level, we should also be very proud of just how different it is now. The pace of discovery has so changed and continues to change so dramatically, fueled by the nature of the tools we use and the pace of sharing ideas and information around the globe. New questions emerge seemingly daily or weekly as new pathways and functions are uncovered, together with details of new genes, new classes of RNA, new protein forms, and new types of mutation. New tools and technologies help elucidate any number of the aspects of new discoveries, whether in genome sequencing, laboratory testing, or new modes of disease treatment, not to mention increased understanding of populations, both current and ancient. There's so much to be proud of, and yet so much to do. Reaching a landmark such as 75 years should remind us that in a field such as ours, learning never ends. We have been and will continue to be both the sources of and the beneficiaries of a seem seemingly endless list of new ideas, theories, technologies, and innovations, all with untold implications for science, for medicine, and for society. The future of human genetics and the future of ASHG is bright indeed. To the students and trainees in this audience, this is your future. And whether you are postdocs or graduate students or undergraduates, this is your future and you are welcome to it. Now 75 years away from our founding, yes, we do indeed work, walk on the footsteps of giants. But also, yes, as we start the next 75 years, we find ourselves watching new footsteps being made by new giants, four of whom are with us to join us today. And so with that, let me introduce our first speaker. We begin with a talk from Adam Rutherford, president of Humanist UK and lecturer in genetics at University College London. Adam will discuss the misuse of Mendel in genetics education. Adam. Thank you, Hans, and thank you for inviting me to be here. So this is a session about the future of genomics, the future of genetics in our field, but in order to address the future, I think it's really important that we actually consult our past, not just because the past is interesting and pernicious, the fact that genetics emerged out of the political ideology of eugenics, which is the basis of, of my work, but also what I'm fundamentally interested in is how the legacy of that history perpetuates and echoes into our current practices, and particularly, as I'll talk about right now, into our education. So I'm mostly going to talk about the history of eugenics, um, which is a history that is not told enough, but is less than 100 years from our present. We're going through this period of re-evaluating some of the giants on whose shoulders we stand. No one's ever referred to me as a giant before, but that was quite nice. Thank you, Hunt, if inaccurate. <laughs> Um, and many of you will be aware of this. So, for example, David Starr Jordan's name was removed from um, Indiana University in the last couple of years. Same with Ronald Fisher. And where I come from, which is University College London, Fisher, Pearson, and Galton's names have all, be, all been removed from our campus after some complex discussions and an inquiry into our history uh, of eugenics at UCL. It all starts with this man. I know you all know him, Francis Galton. Um, who coins the term eugenics in 1883 to give the scientification of an older idea, the idea that we can control and shape society using biology, uh, understanding how biology actually works. But in the wake of Darwin, his half-cousin, Galton, comes up with this idea and spends the rest of his life devoted to spreading with, by his words, a jihad, a religious fervor on uh, uh, guaranteeing that eugenics is how we shape the rest of society. Now, the social context for the emergence of eugenics, at least in the UK, is one of great turmoil. It is the era of uh, Victorian industrialization, rapid 
um, urbanization, a much more visible poor, an increase in institutionalization of people at the bottom of the socioeconomic scale, and so on. And towards the bottom of that list, two elements which are much more relevant to um, the American eugenics movement, which is immigration and the concept that which became known as Great Replacement Theory. But if you are going to improve the quality, the quality of the stock of a people, which was the original intention of those eugenicists, the word itself, eugenics, meaning something like well-born, um, then you have to rank people. And what always happens when eugenics is either discussed or enacted in the 32 countries around the world that had eugenic legislation on its book through, mostly through enforced sterilization, what happens ex is exactly the same thing in all those countries which you see, the ranking of people and uh, the people who are subject to eugenic sterilization or subjugation include racialized minority groups, people with disabilities, people with pseudo-psychiatric diagnoses such as feeble-mindedness, and then it just becomes people we don't like. Now, in the UK, the main political driver of the eugenics movement was Winston Churchill. At this point in 1912, which is the year I'm going to focus on, he is um, the Home Secretary in the Asquith government. And having read pamphlets by what are best described as enthusiastic vasectomizers in Indiana, um, he proposes the involuntary sterilization of people with feeble-mindedness at several occasions during the first a uh, couple of decades of the 20, 20th century, including using the recently discovered Röntgen rays, X-rays, and then tries to get enforced sterilizations onto the statute in a bill which becomes known as the Mental Deficiencies Act in 1913. But due to the filibustering of Josiah Wedgwood, also a descendant from the Galton uh, Darwin clan in the UK, having invented eugenics, we never have eugenics on, a, on our legislation with a whisker, a whisker of the removal of that enforced sterilization clause in that bill. But that is not what happened in the US. Um, here's an example of the enthusiasm with which very senior leaders at this point in 1912 uh, Teddy Roosevelt is an ex-president, but in writing to Charles Davenport, the Galton of America, about eugenics, here he is saying it is the duty, the inescapable duty of the right type of people uh, to not leave behind the wrong type of people. Now, Davenport is really the focus of, of my work at, at the moment. I've just come from Cold Spring Harbor where I was um, beavering around in the, uh, in the archive there. And I know you all know who he is, but as a biologist who was also the director of two of the, the, the official research stations at Cold Spring Harbor at this point, 1907. He also comes back from the UK, having met Francis Galton, and sets up the eugenics records office at Cold Spring Harbor, not actually part of the lab, it's an independent organization. And their job is twofold. It is to spread the word. It is to spread a legal framework to make it easier for legislation to be passed around the United States. And the, the secondary reason is, and the reason it's called the Eugenics Records Office, is to go out to the working classes, particularly to agricultural state fairs, and harvest the uh, pedigree data of working class people in order to construct a pedigree for the American people, and with that, have a pivot on which eugenics policies could be enacted. And, and they were enacted. 31 states over the course of the 20. 20th century had eugenic enforced sterilization, and we estimate between 80,000 and the highest estimates are about half a million people were sterilized in the majority of states in America for the majority of the 20th century. And this is the legacy of our field. Now, I want to talk about Mendel, the effective founder, and he is exonerated from any sort of blame in this story. I love using this picture of Mendel, by the way, because we only ever see him his, his face, the zoom in on that, and he's holding not a pea plant, but a petunia. But I just love the fact that these are the rest of his literal bros, um, <laughs> including the guy who looks a lot like George Bush standing next to him. <laughs> and the weird vampire next to him as well. Anyway, so I think that uh, Mendel's um, experiments in the 1860s are some of the best experiments done in the history of science, and of course you will know they get rediscovered in 1900, or at least retranslated into, into English in 1900. And this happens at exactly the right time for the eugenicists of Cold Spring Harbor, because it gives them a mechanism on which this new idea, the biology of population control, can be enacted. So, what is the human characteristic that we use to teach Mendelian inheritance in humans? What is the first characteristic we use? It is 
eye color, right? And everyone knows in order to pass your exams as a school, as a high school student, you have to put a little Punnett square with big B, little B, but you know, I, don't, I really don't need to explain this to this crowd. Um, we do all know that that is wrong, though, right? I mean, we know that, that um, eye color is A, not a binary phenotype, and B, it is uh, influenced by many genes, as almost all human traits are. Who was it who came up with that model? Who published the first paper on the, uh, the, the Mendelian inheritance of eye color? It was. Charles Davenport and his wife. Now, it's a bad paper. It's a bad study. It's bad for many reasons, but the most obvious one is that he even recognizes that eye color is not a binary trait. And there's a sentence in that paper which says, hazel eyes, we suspect these to be blue. I don't really know what to do with that. <laughs> but the legacy of this piece of research is this is how we teach Mendelian inheritance to high school students. What is the second human trait that we use? Uh, in the UK, it's hair color, particularly red hair, ginger hair. And again, it's a recessive trait. Um, uh, alleles in the MC1R gene are associated with having red hair. We now know that that is not true. The latest studies from UK Biobank data indicate that the majority of people who are homozygous for MC1R red-associated uh, genes do not have red hair. We don't really understand in a really sophisticated way like we do for for example, cystic fibrosis, the mechanisms by which pigmentation in either eyes or hairs, uh, hair occurs. Who first published this? It was Davenport and Davenport again. Of the Mendelian diseases that we use to teach Mendelian inheritance in humans, one of the earliest ones is, of course, Huntington's disease, first documented by Davenport in 1916. Woody Guthrie died of, of Huntington's. Shit, I've only got four minutes left. I'm going to have to really race through this. Okay. Um, but in that abstract, he concludes that it is the result of immigration of four brothers that had Huntington's, and so thus bringing this the political ideology of anti-immigration into the science itself. Here's a textbook from the 1930s which talks about the Mendelian inheritance of feeble-mindedness, but one of the worst examples is the study by Goddard uh, of the Kallikak family, Deborah Kallikak, uh, a, a girl in his charge, who in a best-selling book determined that feeble-mindedness, this peculiar bucket diagnosis, was as a result of the Mendelian inheritance of the feeble-mindedness gene. Now, the legacy of that type of thinking it was hugely significant in the 20th century, not least because it was primarily what the Nazis used in founding their, their Nuremberg Laws um, during the Holocaust, which were based on translations of American legislation from Cold Spring Harbor, were funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, and were inspired intellectually by Charles Davenport and, and the American eugenicists. They were very adept at propaganda. This was a film that was uh, partially funded by the Pioneer Fund, which still exists to this day, which was founded by Harry Lachlan at Cold Spring Harbor, includes use of the Kalakak family tree um, in order to demonstrate that this is why the Nazis and the Third Reich would sterilize people with mental health issues. Now, not everyone at this time was fully on board with this high monogenic um, deterministic view. We know that Pearson was opposed to it, not because he opposed eugenics, but because he approved of eugenics but thought the work was bad. Here's Thomas Morgan um, so saying roughly the same thing, that the environment is hugely important. But now we're at a stage where we have moved from this very monogenic deterministic idea right the way through to what we do today and what we talk about at conferences like this. My argument is that this has not penetrated the broader culture. A monogenic determinism remains the absolute way that we both teach and that people understand human genetics. I used to collect headlines from the press about this. I wanted this to be called Rutherford's Law for reasons none of them vanity, but the idea that if scientists discover, these are all from the sort of g wise gold rush era in the, in the 2000s and noughties, and, and I don't need to go through them, they're all absolutely absurd. The three in the middle row are all from the same gene, DRND4. And the problem is that this idea is so embedded in our culture that we find it very hard to shake it. We all know the complexities of human genetics, but we have failed as an organization, as a group of, of people to convey this to the public. And part of that failure is because this is how we teach it. We teach that Mende Mendelian inheritance with eye color and hair color and so on, that is where we start teaching Mendelian inheritance in humans. Now, recent studies, particularly by Brian Donovan, um, have shown, using randomized control trials, that if you start with Mendelian inheritance in the school curriculum, 
then uh, compared to starting with disease and complexity, but the rest of the content is the same, the cohort that starts with Mendelian inheritance ends up with a much more monogenic, deterministic, and racially essentialized view of people, of genetics. Whereas if you start with complexity and disease, you end up with a lower level. So we are actually not just serving a, a misunderstanding of genetics to our, to our students and to culture more broadly, but the, my conclusions are that this idea which is, is, is culturally embedded is actually in service of the eugenesis of our pernicious past. And that our standard teaching methods reinforce this monogenic deterministic idea that we are not actually serving a public understanding of genetics at all. And if we don't acknowledge and embrace and understand and teach our own history of eugenics, our own pernicious history, as we go forward, we are literally not serving future geneticists at all. We are teaching them ideas which are wrong. That is where I'll end. Fortunately, though, obviously, Francis Galton was a big old bastard, but we have at the top of our evolutionary tree Charles Darwin, who was not. And so I leave you with this phrase from the Descent of Man, which I think is one that we should grab hold to and cling to for as long as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam. That was absolutely fantastic. It remind me one um, symbols that account people in, in Ghana uh, use to drive their future. That symbol actually is a bird, and it's a bird who turns his neck to pick an egg on his back, and turning the neck behind is to look into the past, and picking the egg is to use the past to design the future. Um, it is refreshing that uh, the Galton Institute now has changed the name. It doesn't exist anymore at the Royal Society. I was there uh, two weeks ago. At, now it's called Adelphi Institute. Uh, so looking into the past always have to drive a better future. Part of those, the future will be uh, among the conversation of our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Cynthia Martin. Uh, uh, she works at the is member of the Broad Institute and also member of the Broad Program in Medical and Population Genetics on exploring the non-coding genome in chromosomal structural arrangement. That will be the topic of her talk. Welcome to Dr. Martin. Thank you very much. I'm looking for the rest of my slides, but um, are they going to come up here? Or um, I will say to begin with, I hadn't planned to say this at this point, but that I, oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Let's like just go back and turn around. Good morning. <laughs> okay, so, um, during the past 24 months, I served as chair of the Scientific Advisory Board of Luna Genetics. So it's my pleasure to speak with you on the last day of this celebration of the 75th meeting of the American Society of Human Genetics. I've had a career-long fascination with chromosomes and the technologies that expanded their usefulness in the diagnostics of human disorders. Today, I will speak about our non-coding genome, the dark matter, and the structural rearrangements that result in inherited and de novo germline disorders. Well, I understand that TED Talks are to tell a story. So I'll begin this story by reminding you about the methods applied in cytogenetics that have informed us about human biology, leading us from the unbanded karyotype that I fondly refer to as the original genome scan through banding, fish, and microarrays to the James Webb telescope view where we have learned about our genome on a nucleotide level 
and how variation in our genome contributes to health and disease. I will pose three questions. The first is, why do we solve only 50% of the diagnosis of rare diseases with all of the omics tools we have? Well, I'm going to tell you about a project we undertook called DGAP for Developmental Genome Anatomy Project. The hypothesis of DGAP is a gene discovery in human genetics. Chromosomal region, rearrangements in individuals with congenital anomalies or rearrangements occur in individuals that can be etiologic in the abnormal phenotype due to disruption or dysregulation of genes critical in human development. And there were many diagnostic successes from this project, but not all cases were solved. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about long non-coding RNAs. There have been many attempts at nomenclature and classification of link RNAs by the Hugo Gene Nomenclature Committee, the Gene Code Consortium, and others, predominantly based on their genomic position and orientation relative to protein coding genes. Linking to nearby genes has been useful as it provides context and has sometimes provided clues to link RNA function, for example, in regulating the expression of these genes. Another link characteristic is that there are multiple biotypes, and we'll take a look at two of a total of six that have been described. Divergent XH and antistance inside XI link RNAs comprise 19 to 27 percent and 20 to 21 percent of total link RNAs, respectively, representing the two largest genic link RNA biotypes in human and mouse genomes. Notable is their divergent orientation with respect to the protein coding gene. They are located more closely near to the location of a long interspersed RNA to a coding gene, and more closely than two protein coding genes to each other. You can see the cartoon figure on the left is showing you the antisense head-to-head -head version of the protein coding gene and the link RNA. And below that, you see the presence of the link RNA, which is actually wholly within the protein coding gene. There's something interesting here. So, how might we use cytogenetic rearrangements to interpret variants in link RNAs etiologic in clinical phenotypes? And this is a story of two DGAP cases, DGAP-353 and DGAP-103. So DGAP-353 has a apparently balanced 1417 rearrangement. The Story starts with an amniocentesis about two decades ago, leading to screening of the um, karyotype of the fetus, which had a balanced 1417 translocation, and then determination that the mother had provided that 1417 translocation. There is a shared phenotype of mild to moderate hearing loss in the mother and daughter. There was a negative exome analysis. The literature search revealed a copy number variant in the region of the seven, derivative 17 chromosome in an unrelated patient with hearing loss and many other findings. 
Chromosome 17 breakpoint was located at 260 base pairs upstream of TBX2 in the divergent link RNA, TBX2 antisense 1. TBX2 was shortly thereafter described as a master regulator of hair cell fate in the inner ear. And now we have a mouse model underway for functional verification. Here's a picture of the inner ear, and you can see the inner hair cells, a row of one, and then three rows of outer hair cells. So these are the mechanosensory cells that detect sounds. What we find is that ablation, not we, the, the authors of this beautiful paper, the ablation of TBX2 in a mouse inner hair cell results in four rows of outer hair cells. And ectopic expression of TBX2 in an outer hair cell prevents an outer hair cell from transdifferentiating into an inner hair cell. TBX2 is both necessary and sufficient to make inner hair cells distinct from outer hair cells and then maintain this difference throughout development. So let's talk about case DGAP 353. And you can see the uh, position of TBX2 in the genome browser view underneath the TAD region of chromosome 17 that's uh, relevant. So as I said, it's located quite close to when we look at the TBX2 antisense, which I hope you can see it's like the one, two, three, fourth row down with the arrow pointing to the um, left. And this is not overlapping with TBX2. The breakpoint in TBX2 antisense 1 is indicated by a gold bar. We hypothesize that the TBX2 antisense 1 allele disrupted by this translocation results in a loss of function that affects regulation of TBX2. I'd also like to point out another characteristic that's um, very typical of link RNAs is that the protein coding gene is larger than the antisense gene. And you can see that the TBX2 has seven exons on the forward strand, and then on the negative strand, TBX2 antisense 1 has three exons. So this is just a really wonderful setup to do this experiment to assess a potential loss of function structural rearrangement that could be etiologic in the hearing loss phenotype. The mouse genome has a similarly annotated TBX2 and antisense transcripts, and that will be the focus for the, the uh, creation of the mouse model. So the second case is one of my favorite cases from early on in DGAP. This is an eight-year-old boy who was referred to DGAP for a complex clinical phenotype of facial dysmorphism, overgrowth, advanced dental and bone ages, bilateral uh, bowing of legs, multiple lipomas, arthritis, and brachydactyly of hands and feet. These clinical features were clearly uncommon in a young boy, and a de novo pericentric inversion was present in chromosome 12. So here are the features, some of which I, I uh, presented in the previous uh, slide. You can see there's dysmorphic facies, there's uh, dental overgrowth, you see the brachydactyly, and then the histopathology from the uh, multiple lipomas. So his parents had actually recognized that he was on an overgrowth pattern, and that was at four months of age. He had all his baby teeth. At four years, he was as tall as an eight-year-old, and his final height was seven feet, eight and a half inches, following treatment by his endocrinologist with high-dose testosterone. So what role might link RNAs play in the DGAP-103 phenotype? 
So here again, we return to the TAD picture and picture from the genome browser. This gene that you see spanning most of that region is the gene known as HMG and GA2, which encodes an architectural protein that binds DNA to provide accessibility to transcription factors. The gold line, again, marks the point of the inversion in this particular rearrangement, um, and this is the inversion point on the long arm of chromosome 12. This transcript, the divergent uh, transcript is telomeric to the breakpoint on the long arm of chromosome 12 and separates the three AT hook domains from the N-terminal end of this architectural protein. So the five prime region of HMTGA2 with the AT hook domains resides on the reverse strand centromeric within the TAD on chromosome 12, that includes parathyroid hormone-like hormone. Loss of function in parathyroid hormone is etiologic in type 4 brachydactyly. So although the precise mechanism of the loss of function uh, for parathyroid hormone remains to be known, the striking phenotype of brachydactyly in this setting of long bone overgrowth leads one to the hypothesis of a loss and gain of function from the pericentric inversion in DGAP 103. There are other cases of DGAP yet to be explored and also very many cases undoubtedly in this collection of individuals in the audience who have looked at chromosomes um, over their lifespan. And these cases await further investigation. So I want to call out to you as a community of cytogeneticists in particular, we have an opportunity once again to step forward from the James Webb to the James Webb telescope from the original genome scan. Let's stand together and seize this next opportunity with our knowledge of structural rearrangements to serve individuals who await our insight into their biology and to their potential future therapies. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Our next speaker will be Melissa Davis founding director of the Institute for Translational Genomic Medicine at Morehouse School of Medicine. Melissa will discuss the dark side of ge uh, genetics and cancer, consequences of Duffy Null in breast cancer disparities. Melissa. Hi. <laughs> And thank you to the organizers and our previous speakers, particularly Adam. I'm usually the most controversial person in the room. <laughs> so I'm not quite as nervous as I normally would be. All right, so first my obligatory disclosures. Most of these are just advisory capacity for diversity. So here's the problem. I study breast cancer disparities, particularly in the United States. Mortality rates for black women are 40% higher than white women. But that wasn't always the case. But before I tell you more about that, I'm showing you a map here, county by county of poverty percentages across the United States. We know that socioeconomic status certainly does have an impact on health outcomes because it impacts your accessibility to curative therapies. But what we also notice is when we take a deeper dive in terms of socioeconomic status and race in this country, what we find is that black patients who live in wealth in affluent counties, they still have a higher mortality rate than their white counterparts who live in poverty. So that tells us that SES status isn't necessarily the driving force of racial disparities. But particularly for breast cancer, we see that disparities in mortality actually only arose in the mid-1990s when we had standard of care for targeted uh, immune, uh, I'm sorry, targeted endocrine ther therapies, which became standard of care. When we look at the multivariate factors that cause racial disparities, what we see is that tumor characteristics actually has one of the most influential uh, impacts in racial disparities. And one of those tumor characteristics is hormone receptor, hormone receptor status. This hormone receptor status is currently still 
primarily um, identified by Im immunohistochemistry staining. To the far right, what we see is the column of a patient who has what we call triple negative breast cancer because her tumor has stained negative for H, HER2, PR, and uh, ER status. Um, this triple negative breast cancer subtype ex exists at the worst end of the prognosis spectrum. This is because it's one of the most aggressive forms of breast cancer, and unfortunately, it is more than twice um, more than twice likely to be diagnosed in African Americans. But we also know that it doesn't behave the same in African Americans as it does in white Americans. So what I'm showing you here is about 20 years worth of data. This is from two large metropolitan uh, hospital areas in um, Detroit. So this includes Henry Ford Health Systems and New York Presbyterian Hospital Systems. What we wanted to do was assess whether or not screen detection could improve health outcomes. And just to be on the same page, screen detected diagnoses simply mean that the patient was diagnosed because of a screening mammography, whereas non-screen detected cancers are detected because patients are compelled to come into the clinic. So by definition, screen detection is usually going to be an earlier stage cancer. So we saw what we expected, which is that screen detected cancers had better overall survival represented by the blue line which replicated in white women. What we did not expect to see was that there was an even starker um, disparity in outcomes for black patients. Now when clinicians see this data, they initially say we need to screen more in the black population, but epidemiology data actually says that we screen more in the black population already. There wasn't a difference in screen detection in these, in these different populations. There wasn't even a difference in stage but there was a difference in outcome. So I see this data and I think there's something different about the tumor biology because the treatments don't actually work the same. So other um, members of the community and myself who are also investigators oftentimes see these disparities and we are met with some type of opposition. The longstanding under the, the long-standing sort of assumptions is that it didn't matter who you were. If you had cancer, the mechanisms were the same. However, we continue to persist to try to identify what the differences were. One of my first collaborators is Dr. Clayton Yates. At the time we started, he was at Tuskegee University, and many of the different um, investigators who studied disparities were at historically black colleges and universities. Clayton is now a full professor at Johns Hopkins. One of the first studies we did was to reanalyze TCGA genomic data. What we found was that the black women who had triple negative breast cancer had a fourth hormone receptor negativity for androgen receptor, which we coined quadruple negative breast cancer. Quadruple negative breast cancer had an earlier onset, and in a complex genetic disorder, earlier onset typically means there's potentially a genetic predisposition. So we went on to study quadruple negative breast cancer and we phenotyped the tumors in every way possible and what we saw was that African Americans had the most aggressive kind in any way you could define it. We went on and we studied independent cohorts, cell lines, we found different um, gene signaling pathways using systems biology approaches. We used epigenetics approaches and we found microRNA signatures that were specific to African Americans, so specific that if we took those microRNA signatures into an independent cohort, we could predict race. One of those microRNA signatures was a regulator of the CMYK pathway, but it was only clinically relevant in African-American women. And so many times editors would say, well, it's only relevant in a small population, and it's not interesting to the majority of our readership. Enter in my current research partner, Dr. Lisa Newman, who's chief of breast surgery at New York Pres Presbyterian Hospital, and her concept of oncologic anthropology. Dr. Newman is a surgeon, and she's spent nearly 20 years now on the continent of Africa doing training for general surgeons. And what she recognized was that the patients that she would treat in Ghana on the west coast of Africa tended to be much younger, and the majority of them had triple negative breast cancer, nearly 80% of them, compared to the East African patients in Ethiopia who tended to have rates of luminal breast cancer that were the same as the white women that she would treat. So as we did this continental surveillance, what we saw was that the West African nations had the highest rate of triple negative breast cancer. In fact, globally, the highest rates of triple negative breast cancer are in sub-Saharan Africa. And then in any country where we can separate race, 
or ancestry by self-report. It is the black or African component of the population that has the highest rate of triple negative breast cancer. So what is the African connection? Well, first of all, we have to recognize that this population isn't like many of the other human subpopulations that we study. It's not a founder population where a single migrant migration event occurred where a group of individuals would move from one region to another and then we would have typical gene flow. Instead, what we have here is the transatlantic slave trade where there's a continuous gene flow over centuries where nearly 13 million genomes were dispersed across the Americas and the Caribbean um, countries and with it, all of those genomes and the potential for clinical consequences. And what could be those clinical consequences? Well, we know there are ancestral informative markers. That's how we're able to test individuals and tell them the composition of their genetic ancestry. The question is whether or not any of those ancestral informative markers could potentially have clinical relevance. And here I'm showing you the geographic distribution, clearly demarcating different geographic regions of the AB blood group. And here's another that we call Duffy. Now, if it was May 4th, Yoda would show up right right above um, Canada there. So the dark gene is a protein, it's a chemokine receptor, and it's normally expressed on endothelial cells as well as, well as red blood cells. The Duffy null mutation removes expression of the gene specifically on red blood cells. It was fixed in Sub-Saharan Africa because it conferred immunity to malaria because the protein is actually the docking site for plasmodium vivax. So having the mutation means that you don't get that form of malaria. And I'll come back to why that's relevant in cancer. But in our large international cohort for the ICSBCS with Dr. Newman, the first thing we did was to measure West African ancestry. And what we found was that West African ancestry was associated with having triple negative breast cancer. But what does that even mean? In an admixed population, we know that ancestry is stochastically distributed across all of the chromosomes. So having more of West African ancestry just simply means there's a higher likelihood that you're probably carrying a predisposition or a disease load Focus that's in the background of that West African ancestry, but we just don't know what it is yet because we haven't really done a great job of representing this particular group of individuals in our genetic data. If you ever get a gift from me, it's going to be wrapped in the cover of Cancer Discovery with this beautiful picture of Africa because this was one of the papers we published last year. In it, we use genetic ancestry in a unique way. So the first figure shows us the distribution of global and local ancestry. I'll just point out a couple of things. First of all, that Africa uh, is a continent, but the regional um, origin of African ancestry in our, in our African Americans actually tells us that every region of Africa is represented in the African background of African Americans, and their European origin of their admixture comes from just about every region of Europe. And so the heterogeneity in this population certainly confounds any ability to look at them as a separate population. We use genetic ancestry as a continuous variable and identified a subset of genes that were specifically associated with ancestry. When we looked before using self-reported race, we could definitely detect differences, but when we removed race and used ancestry, the clarity of the differential expression was profound. When we looked at what the functionality of those genes were, we saw that it was related to immune responses. But that was counterintuitive because the activation of immune receptors or immune cell migration should have given people of African descent a better overall survival. But instead, what we find is that African Americans, even with a high count of immune cells, still don't have a survival benefit. And perhaps that's because of evolutionary consequences where we know that different cells or, this, or the same cells from people of African versus European ancestry don't respond the same to the same bacterial pathogens. So now we know that dark expression in tumors helps facilitate inflammation, helps facilitate immune cell infiltration. But you also are a part of a marginalized group. If you're of African descent, then you're more likely to be a marginalized, racialized group that is in an environment that is the result of structural racism. 
which means you actually have a higher likelihood of having systemic inflammation because of food insecurities and other environmental cues that spark inflammation. And so in this perfect storm, when we pay more close attention now to self-reported race associations, so those genes that were in the blue bubble, when we look at the functionality of those differentially expressed genes, even in the context of all of the patients being of the same ancestral background, so African-Americans compared to Africans, what we find is that the genes that are race-specific, they're more related to the comorbidities that are associated with structural racism. They're more associated with genes related to obesity, diabetes, insulin resistance, and other metabolic disorders. And I'll end there thanking my funders and our collaborators, and thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Melissa. Uh, one humanity, uh, many genomes, um, but again, we still have so many million of genomes that we need to understand to fully uh, implement genomic medicine on the equitable way. Our next speaker will probably share with us how can we approach that. The next talk will be from Dr. Karen Mega. She's Associate Director at the UCSC Genomic Institute one single genome to the pan genome will be the thematic of our presentation, uh, exploring the revolutionizing genomics with routine telomere to telomere assembly. Let's welcome uh, Dr. Karen Miga. Thank you. I have nothing to disclose. Now the first map of a human genome was transformative for the field of genetic research and genomic research, we all know that. And if we start to think about that sequence, not as a string of characters, but perhaps as a linear coordinate-based system, we can start thinking everywhere around the world that had access to internet could download that linear coordinate-based system and begin to build upon it, build information from a global biomedical research group. The way I like to think about this is similar to thinking about Google Maps. Nobody's using the Google Map app because they want to know GPS coordinates. You're going there because you want to know how to get to your friend's house, a restaurant, a hospital. In other words, it's a GPS coordinate-based system, but the impact is really in that information that sits on top. This is important because for decades, Billions of dollars have been put into annotating this coordinate-based genome map collectively across the biomedical research community. And we've made great strides in doing this. We have new information with basic science. We have detailed map of gene organization, splicing, non-coding regulatory elements, and ideas moving into systems biology. We now have moved into clinical genetics and genomics where we have catalogs of disease genes. We can think about sequences that go towards biomarkers, sites in our genomes that are important for strategic therapeutics. And we've been pouring sequence information into this coordinate-based system to understand frequency and global allele frequency information that has been important to clinical genetics, population genetics, as well as human evolution and human histories. In other words, we have been invested and we are dependent on this incredible coordinate-based map that is full of information. But I'm here to remind you that this map is a tool. It's a tool that's designed to make you have your best science. And like all tools, it's probably due for an upgrade. I don't know that many tools that we have in our lab that haven't been upgraded over the past two decades, software. The idea of our sequencing technology, instruments, medical instruments, maybe even lab equipment, all of this has updates. Our own phones and computers probably have been updated within the last two years, let alone two decades. However, we hold strong to this relationship that we have with this flawed tool. And it's flawed for three reasons. It's flawed because it's incomplete. It's flawed because it's based on a reconstruction of backs, so it doesn't actually represent a natural human haplotype. And it's flawed because it's one genome. And one genome cannot possibly represent 
the global genetic diversity that we know we have in our population. And because of that, it introduces genetic bias, and that can cause that some individuals will not benefit from the use of this map as others. So I'm here today to try to encourage us to think about the future, because we have amazing technology now that can enable complete genomes and pangenomics. We can fix this tool, and we can make it to where you can do your best science in the future. Now, when I started working with the T2T consortium as well as the Pangenome consortium, we were really relating all of our work to the human reference genome known as HG38. At the time, we knew that there were these very large gaps that represented hundreds of thousands of bases that were missing. Now, we had a goal. We wanted to be comprehensive in our study. That meant we didn't want to have gaps where we weren't able to make new inference in genome biology and human disease. And we also knew that some of these gaps were critical and important for genome biology. There were gene families that were missing. There were areas of segmental duplications in our subtelomeric and pericentric regions that were underrepresented. Centromeres, which were critical for how cells divide during cell division, were missing, and five acrocentric short arms were missing from our map. Of course, we are in a place today where it is now possible to generate highly accurate end-to-end -end or telomere-to-telomere -telomere chromosome assemblies. This is really crediting pioneering long-read technology from the HiFi platform from PacBio, as well as ultra-long data from Oxford Nanopore. Even this week, the T2T consortium has released an incredibly highly validated diploid T2T genome, HG002. I encourage you to go see it. But I am also wanting you to realize that these complete T2T genomes will soon be routine. If we allow ourselves to think five to ten years into the future, this is likely going to mean that these will be a common or standard genomic feature. Not only that, they'll be highly accessible. And what do I mean by accessible? That means they'll be affordable, they will be time, you'll have time to do it, be quick, and they also have a small sample prep that will go with it. Most importantly, it'll be accessible because you don't have to be an expert to do it anymore. You know, after we first assembled the first human centromere on the Y, I had dinner with colleagues, and I told them, I was like, I think my daughter, who's now four, when she goes into middle school or high school, she'll be able to use some of these long-read technologies and begin to actually see end-to-end -end chromosomes. And I think that's a reality now. I think some of the programs that I do with our, my own daughter, thinking about how you can see this mucus of the big octopoid strawberry, but if we move that into one of the smaller strawberries, like 240 megabases, this is something that we can do almost on handheld sequencers to bring this into the classroom. We aren't there yet with human genomes. It's not push button. It's not automated T to T. However, we are close. When I started with the Human Pangenome Project four years ago, we were talking about on the order of forty to $45,000 for about 30 genomes per year. Now our budget's down closer to about $10,000. We can run an assembly of a human genome in a day with 64 cores, and we do it for about $40 on the cloud. We get about, on average, 14 of these T to T chromosomes. Now, this is not perfect, but I want you to realize that we're moving fast and furious, and we're going to get there. And this is really building off the success of the Telomere to Telomere Consortium, as well as the Human Pangenome Reference Consortium. For those of you who don't know, the Human Pangenome is really designed to replace or reboot our singular reference genome with a whole cohort of 350 or 700 phased haplotypes of globally diverse genomes as I'm showing here. And you can imagine if you had one linear chromosome, it's just a straight line. And what I'm trying to show you is if you had a whole panel of T to T genomes, you now have this collection. You can think about a pan genome as just being an alignment of that information. Unlike a straight line, you can think about a pan genome like a subway map, where areas that are shared, and you can also see the areas where they differ or diverge. Now, the human pan genome is not only creating all these amazing complete reference genomes, they're also issuing a number of tools that can actually customize pan-genomic data sets. This is important. These are tools that can not only lead to workflows that can lead to complete genomes, causing a ripple effect outside of our project where other teams will start to actively begin to make complete genomes, but also the workflows that are all open access of how you take that information and build your own pan-genome. 
how you build a pangenome, and then use pangenomic tools to do all these common genetic work streams and work analyses that we do now. And what's going to be the result of that? We're going to wake up in five or ten years, and there is going to be a new world where there's going to be a lot of talks here at ASHG with people who have their own collections of complete genomes, their own pangenomic analysis, and we have a lot of challenges ahead to know how we're going to understand if these pangenomes are high quality, how are we going to interact between different models of data sovereignty and, and data sharing, how can we issue new global federated systems to take a sum of parts and make it one whole. This may also reach into the clinic. There's a real advantage to having a highly accurate, complete genome for a patient who suffers from rare disease. One could imagine as well that there could be an advantage just in the future for someone who's healthy to have as part of their common record and their actual genome, a complete genome. Of course, we all know in the audience that we are not just one genome. We are a collection of genomes, and a collection of genomes that likely change through somatic mutation as we age and as we experience disease. And this is once again where complete genomes and the use of pangenomic tools come into play and in how we think even about individual genomes and genetics. This could extend out even from that one individual to encompass their entire family. So now we can see the emergence of ped pedigree pangenomes where now you can begin to track inheritance of alleles and identify de novo mutations. We're already doing this in my lab. My postdoc, Monica Chakova, is leading an experiment now where we're looking at three generational pedigrees and we're generating complete reference genomes. And it's so cool because we get to actually study genetic and epigenetic inheritance in some of the most complex regions in the genome. Here I'm showing you the X centromere, which was inherited from the father to the daughter. And we can look base by base to show that that array was inherited and is identical. However, your eyes can hopefully see the, the green box I drew for you or the blue squiggle line, where we're able to monitor these shifts in epigenetic inheritance. Of course, we can extend further from our own close family into recognizing that we're all one larger family. And we share older, common haplotypes. And once we begin to take a census of extent humans, we can begin to look back and start to do ancestral reconstruction of these haplotypes and start to understand shared associations and, and structures with, that exist that could be important for understanding disease risk. Now, it's been really fun studying haplotypic structure through some of these complete genomes, because in some of the regions that were most recently introduced that you can only get to with complete genomes, they're typically rich in heterochromatin or protected, and this makes them less likely to have meiotic recombination. As a result, what we find is that these are big linkage blocks. Big, meaning like tens of megabases that sometimes sit in your chromosomes. And you can think of them like Y haplogroups. If they're not broken, they're carried through like an ancestral unit through time. And when we take these linkage blocks and we begin to cluster them, we can start to assign them into groups, and we can look at their flanking regions where we can map precisely and do some dating. And we're finding that some of these old, very old stories of human history, some of perhaps individuals in this room, contain parts of your genomes that represent this type of introgressed older um, humans that we can now study through complete genomes. Just looking at two examples, we can zoom in once again on their complex regions, and we see that there's a complete turnover of the sequence level at some of the sequences of the centromeres um, when we study these more old centromeric structures that are in these, these haplotypes. Now, it really is, as we start to move further and further back, an opportunity for us to not only stick with humans, but to start thinking about how we can start to relate human genomes to non-human primates. This is work that's active and ongoing for the T2T consortium, noting that we've had our second release now of T2T genomes that you can download today, describing sequence from chimp, bonobo, gorilla, orangutan, and, and gibbon. And I can't tell you how much fun the Slack channel is for T2T now. <laughs> how many uh, times there's calls for rat genomes, ruminant genomes. Uh, it's just taking off. And this is not just a one-off genome. You can instantly imagine how all of these clades of species will soon have collective genomes and will soon turn into pangenomes as well. So with that, I want to end my talk. I just want to say that this is really the idea of going towards complete genomes or seeing the entirety or totality of one's genome is really the promise of the original Human Genome Project. 
moving into this global pan uh, pan-genome or trying to look extensively really gives value also in the spirit of the pan-genome and, and the original human genome project and going into comparative genomics. And I think this all ties into the themes here of ASHG where we have one humanity and many genomes once again. And the final words for Ambrose. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for all the attendees and the panelists for this fantastic session. Um, I have the privilege for the final one, and I thank that organizer for that. So one humanity, many genomes, um, a vision that beautifully encapsulated the remarkable progress we have collectively achieved over the past 75 years with the American Society of Human Genetics. This progress has benefited many people across the world. As with the previous 74 meetings, this year's event has once again showcased the brilliance of science, witnesses over the last four days, along with the exceptional presentation our uh, final panelists uh, have displayed today. One Humanity, Many Genomes serves as a powerful reminder of our shared humanity, our shared evolutionary origin. It reminds us that, after all, we are fundamentally all African. Beyond being a feel-good statement, it is a vision of hope. It is a commitment for the future of genomics. It shares light on the work that lies ahead, our scientific agenda for the years to come. It is a mandate to explore the diverse genome out there and try for a sustainable, innovative, like the work of Karen, and equitable genetic medicine agenda for all population across the globe. To fully realize that vision, I propose five point agenda for the next few years. The first is knowledge expansion. We need to significantly enhance our understanding of the genomic variation, particularly among African population, as displayed by the work of Melissa. The reason is not just equity. It is because that genome housed untapped genetic diversity accumulated over 3,000 years of our human genomic history on the continent of Africa. This includes waves of variation, migration, admixture, natural selection, and exploration of genomes from archaic humanoid that never move out of Africa. The second point we should focus on is the human modulating factor of our genome. This includes recent migration across continent. It includes admixture of people like in this room. It includes consanguinity practices that changes the dynamic of our genomes. It's also the impact of geographical isolate, all those people in many places in the world but that we haven't yet studied. The third element of our agenda needs to be the environmental dynamics. We must gain a deeper understanding of the ever-evolving environmental factors, including the current and projected climate change. What would that mean for our genome? The shift in biodiversity, the emergence of new infectious disease. Are we gonna see some of our genome material move or change because of the COVID-19 pandemic? Why we consider very seriously the microbiome on organ, effect on organ system and also on our health. The fourth main pillar of our next agenda to my view is the advance in genomic analysis. There is a need for significant advancement in applying conventional computer, mathematical and statistical method, as well as harnessing the power of machine learning and artificial intelligence technology to investigate the function of both coding and non-coding region, local and long-range regulation, three-dimensional chromosomal compartment-related regulation, and the complexity of the system that we have, the system biology as a discipline. And lastly, data ethics and governance need to be at the center of what we do. 
the open data philosophy I hope we all embrace, crucial for full implementation of genetic medicine globally, should take in account the variable ethical, legal, and social aspect of data sharing regime across the world. It's important to redefine what means intellectual property regulation across the world, commercialization of product from genomic medicine, and address the challenges posed by new laws like genetic sovereignty that is more and more common across many nations. We must also address the practicalities of the right to not to know. We don't need to know everything at least at the clinical or personal level. As we conclude this session, I would like to express my gratitude to all the American Society of Human Genetics attendees in the name of my co-chair, to the speakers, to the sponsor, to the diligent organizing committee sitting in front here for delivering a truly memorable, enjoyable event filled with groundbreaking science and also a lot of joy. We all remember yesterday night. If you wasn't there, we probably need to redo it tonight. It wouldn't work. The celebration of our 70th anniversary last night specifically uh, with the unforgettable dance floor power by the uh, outstanding musical performance of uh, Etidium Spill, a future big people. Amongst them, Dr. Francis Collins. Amongst them, Dr. Anthony Antonelis, Dr. Elliot Margulis, and uh, John Chisdell. All of them are members of this organization. I would like a shout for them, please. Genetic and Joyce is important, but as they say, what happens in Washington must stay in Washington. <laughs> in closing, I'm deeply honored for the privilege that the organizing committee have given to me to co-chair and deliver this closing remark. I want to thank all of you for your kind attention and wish you a safe journey back home. We eagerly anticipate to see you in Denver, in Colorado, November 5, November to 9, 5 to 9 for the next American Society of Human Genetics in 2024. Thank you and safe travel, one humanity, many genomes. <laughs>